。主任，如果啊，呃，上一堂课那个老师他除了点名以外啊，他很特别，他后续还整理了一个呃。早操就是有哪几个学生他回答了问题之后，他会帮他加一分，然后后续我们就有把这个资料再 pass 给马来西亚 IMU 大学那边，所以我觉得如果呃他们真的回馈的不错的话，也可以就是把他们的名称记下来，然后我们把这个资料提供给对方。好，谢谢啊，真的好，那我们就开始吗？小一科啊，啊，小一 begin， 谢谢。OK，Good、okay. morning, dear classes. 啊、uh, ，This is Dr. Chen. Yeah. Oh, it's my great. Hello, everybody online. So let me take off my mask. Okay. Yeah. So since. So, so can everybody hear me、uh, loud and clearly? Okay, good. So, <clears throat> well, it it had uh it has been a great uh uh pleasure for me to have this uh sharing uh well from my the development of my medical career uh I had a tough time uh through the basic medicine uh courses. However, when I get into clinical uh medicine. You see, you when you have some clinical pictures in mind, it helps you get into、uh, your 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 medical career much more easily than you only imagine、uh, from the basic medicine. So today, I'm going to spend some time with you guys、uh, to introduce you some common diseases in pediatrics. And I hope all of you guys、uh, can have a great time with me.、Uh, as you guys know, pediat pediatrics is very important. It's the future. The children's is the future for our world. So when we talk about pediatrics, what have you?、Uh, you guys may have some、uh, idea in mind. So some.、Uh, There are some medical. There are some. Oh, excuse me, the slide. Sorry, the the slide、uh, is having a little. Okay. So, let me intro introduce you、uh, the some of the pediatric diseases、uh, from、uh, the most vital organs. Okay, so when we talk about a cardiovascular disease, when we talk about a cardiovascular disease, we know there are congenitals and some are acquired. Okay. When we talk about congenital heart disease, we know uh, it. Uh, we know that、uh, the baby or the child is born with the disease, and the prevalence for congenital heart disease is actually is quite high. It's like six to eight per a thousand、uh, personnel. Okay.、Uh, when we talk about acquired heart disease, it's mostly due to inflammation. Virus, bacteria, or some metabolic disorders. Okay. So,、uh, next, okay.、Uh, 
Uh, as we go on, uh, before we keep on going, I would like to encourage uh, the, our fellow classes. Uh, through uh, the class, I might ask some questions, okay? And uh, if anybody can answer the questions, uh, I can just write down your name and uh, ask some credit, okay, for you in your class, okay, and present it to your uh, homeroom teachers, okay? Okay, let's keep on going. So congenital heart disease, when we talk about congenital heart, as I said previously, it's like six to eight per 1,000 in populations. Uh, most of the ideologies are related to maternal infections, drug or radiological factors, such as any drug that mom, that a, a pregnant uh, mother, a woman can take through their courses of pregnancy, uh, they all might affect uh, the fetus, the baby, okay? And the third factor is the diseases that the mother has, like uh, DM or SLE, okay? System, uh, systemic lupus erythematous. And of course, there are always some genetic anomaly, uh, like some chromosome anomaly, oh, as everybody uh, might know, uh, Quite a lot is the like Down syndrome, oh. and there are some congenital anomalies. Okay, uh, as we can see from the pictures on the right, here is a sample of congenital rubella. What is congenital rubella? Is when a mother has an acute infection through their pregnancy, and what will that cause the baby? What will that affect a baby? Mostly we know when the mother has a congenital rubella, the baby, the poor kid, might have a, a classic triad. What we mean by a classic triad is the first PDA. PDA is patent doctor's arteriosis. Okay, patent doctor's arteriosis. And secondary is, uh, is cataract or death. Okay, the baby might have cataract. As we can see, the baby look. Uh, the baby's eyes. It was born with a cataract when uh, he or she was first born. Normally, a cataract develops around the age of 50 or 60s uh, when, they, uh, when we, uh, we expose too, too, uh, too many sunlight. But uh, as we can see from this example, the baby was born with cataract. Okay? And the third, Blueberry muffin rush, as we can see in these pictures, blueberry muffin rush, uh, the baby uh, have a lot of rush uh, on the skin. And not only that, uh, the baby, uh, when they have congenital rubella, as we can see in these pictures, the baby is tend to be very yellow, right? It's because the liver are also affected. Okay, the liver are also affected. So, a mother, when she got affected by the rubella, the baby will have all these questions. So, congenital heart is, of, is related to many uh, etiologies. Okay? And uh, when, we, when the mother has uh, DM, like we can see over here, like 30%, 30 percent, 30% might have, with, uh, when the mother has uh, diabetes, it might affect the baby, especially. Imagine the baby, when the mother has DM, the blood sugar control in the mother might not be that good. So on uh, the baby, uh, the most important organ on the heart might gain too much sugar supply. So pe the baby might have in interventricular septal hypertrophy, which means the heart is fat, okay? It's hypertrophied, okay? And besides that, not only that, it has, it might cause transposition of blood vessels. Coarctation of aorta means that the aorta is not patent 
it has a coarctation, a stenosis of the aorta, which causes the blood flow cannot be that fluent. Okay? And all this will cause the baby a lot of troubles. So, when the firstborn baby has a congenital heart, what, he or what the family needs to do is very importantly is genetic consultations. As I mentioned uh, previously, when in a normal population, through their first pregnancy, there will be a chances about six to eight per thousand uh, in population might have congenital heart. And what about the second pregnancy? When the first pregnancy is six to eight per thousand, what about the second pregnancy? Is there anybody want to take a guess? Let me ask, uh, is, is uh, Jasmine Chi? Is Jasmine, Jasmine, is Jasmine there in class? Hello, Jasmine. Yeah? Okay, so Jasmine, we would like to take a guess if the first pregnancy is six to eight per a thousand, what about the second pregnancy? Do you think uh, the rate, the pre the prevalence of congenital heart might increase? Okay. Okay, due to our time limitation, so let me just uh, move, uh, go on, okay? Increase, right? Very good guess, Jasmine. Excellent, okay? But how many fold? How many times of increasing? It's like 10 times, okay? So the second pregnancy will like to be 6 to 8 per 100 population, okay? Would, like, would have congenital heart. That's 10 times of increase, okay? And what about the third pregnancy? If the family, during their first and second pregnancy, they all have congenital heart disease child. The third pregnancy, the chances of having congenital heart, dis heart disease is even much higher. It's like 30 over 100, okay? So from this example, we know the genetic consultation is very, very important for a family that has uh, congenital heart disease, okay? So as we move on, for congenital heart, there is another very important point about diagnosis, okay? Besides the maternal history, we also need to take very close physical examination of the neonate, okay? What we mean by neonate is that uh, the age from birth to the first month of their age. We call it neonate, okay? So the physical ex examination of neonate is so important. It's like when you take your stethoscope, about 90% of the newborn, when they, when they have congenital heart disease, it will present it with a heart murmur, okay? It will present it with a heart murmur. So, a close physical examination is very important. Many, through the earlier days, many people in Taiwan, when they uh, receive their vaccines, they normally do not come to our patient clinic they always uh, go to a, a very general practice, uh, a, a fam family uh, practice doctors. But uh, it happens, some of the doctors did not take very close physical examination for the new bones. So there are chances that when the new bone was taken to my uh, outpatient clinic, I always noted like, about one third of the neonate, they have heart murmur, but no doctors had ever told them. So physical examination for the neonate is very important, okay? But 
for the confirmation of a congenital heart disease, there are a series of ex examination that should be done. For example, the chest X-ray, EKG, a variant esophagography, cardiac echo, or catheter. And among all these, all these tests, the most precise examination to detect congenital heart disease, heart disease is cardiac echo, okay? Cardiac echo. Cardiac echo is not an uh, invasive exam examination, but it can give a detailed pictures about the structure of the heart. So cardiac echo is a very important examination to find out congenital heart disease, okay? And uh, so for congenital heart, we can divide it. Uh, there are two types of congenital heart disease. One is the non-cyanotic congenital heart. What do I mean by non-cyanotic is that uh, the people does not have a central cyanosis. And the second type is cyanotic heart disease. What I mean by a central cyanosis is that as we can see from the picture down here, this baby is presented with a central cyanosis, which means the central part, for example, the perioral area, as everybody can see, look, is a little bit purple, bluish discoloration, right? As compared to other skin color. And uh, there are chances of Peripheral cyanosis, as we can see from these pictures, the baby has a, a peripheral cyanosis. The, the hand tended to be a purple bluish. But a peripheral cyanosis cannot always indicate a congenital heart, especially a cyanotic congenital heart, because when baby, their exposure they exposed to a cold environment after birth. They might have this. They might have this uh, phenomenon develop. Okay. And uh, for cyanotic heart disease, there is also a chances of uh, finding a clubbing finger. What we mean by clubbing finger is everybody can see these pictures. So the class noted they have some difference. Look on their fingernail uh, and their fingertip. And look at your fingernail and your fingertip. is different, right? Because it tends to be like a, a drumstick uh, of uh, this fingernail. This is what we call a clubbing finger, a clubbing finger. Okay, so let's move on to respiratory disease. I'll show you. Uh, if we want to talk about uh, the pediatric diseases, we have uh, we can spend the whole semester, okay? But uh, today we only have a two-hour class, so uh, what Dr. Chen uh, wants to do is to give uh, you guys a brief uh, introduction about some of the most common pediatric diseases, so everybody can have some general ideas in mind, okay? So, so for pediatric uh, respiratory disease. When we talk about pediatric respiratory disease, we can take it, we can look at it from X thoracic cage respiratory tract anomaly or, and disease, or intra thoracic cage respiratory tract disease. Okay, so when we talk about X thoracic cage respiratory disease, it means that is outside the thoracic cage. Okay, when and uh, some of the most common uh, uh, thoracic cage respiratory disease. The most common thing is laryngomalacia. Laryngomalacia. Uh, this is a disease when the cartilage portion of the, of the epiglottis was not well developed. Okay? It's a benign condition. However, it did not occur from, uh, since the birth. It mostly occurs within six weeks after birth. Okay? So, Many parents will, uh, when they bring their kids to your clinic, they will often ask you, doctor, 
Is there any problem with my kids? It was not born with this、uh, weird sound, okay? Which is like is like a strider sound. Strider sound means、uh, a pig snoring sound. It's like ah ah ah. The the child will breathe in with a a pig snoring sound. It's like a strider, okay? And that occurs mostly within six weeks after birth, okay? And besides that. We can also observe there is a suprasternal retraction. Okay, you can see、uh, when when you see、uh, there suprasternal area when the baby breathes, they might have some retractions. Okay, in most of the case, it will spontaneous resolve within two years of age. Okay, mostly mostly, but when the baby Or when the child have some、uh, gross retardation problems, we have to think: could it be a problem caused by this laryngeal malacia, or is there any underlying disease that cause the presentation like a laryngeal malacia, but it is not actually a laryngeal malacia? The best way to confirm whether it is a truly a laryngeal malacia, or it has underlying disease, is to perform a laryngeal scope examination, or even do a bronchoscope evaluation. But by performing a laryngeal scope exam、uh, examination or a bronchoscope examination, we need to sedation. The child, which is of potential risk, because the baby or the child might forget to breathe, and、uh, it might occur sudden infant death. So, for to prove with the confirmation with laryngoscope or bronchoscope, we always save to the very late stage when the baby. Or when the child did not develop very well, okay. Okay, so that's for the laryngeal malacia, and、uh, next when it's very common to see、uh, for extra thoracic、uh, respiratory tract disease is the croup croup syndrome.、Uh, for croup syndrome, there are many types of croup. The first type is viral croup. Okay, viral croup. What it means, is, of course. Is like in friend、uh, infection、uh, for from a, a virus or the pathogen, and it will in、uh, it will cause cough, runny nose, fever, and most importantly, most importantly, they will present a dog like coughing. Have any anybody heard like、uh, a dog like coughing? I don't know if anybody heard like dog like coughing. For me, dog like coughing,、uh, because I'm a pediatrician, I、uh, have a lot of experience. It is really true that the baby will cough like, huh, 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 huh. It's just it's just like a dog barking. So we call it dog like coughing. Okay. It's mainly due to As we can see, due to the swelling of the vocal cord and the surrounding structure, okay, you see, a normal larynx has two vocal cord and the trachea is very clear cut. But when a virus infection, it will cause inflammation of the larynx, it will cause the swelling of the larynx. Of the trunk of of the vocal cord, okay, it will cause the swelling of the vocal cord, and that's why it causes the sound, the coughing sound is the barking, okay, like a dog. Uh, for the treatment of the virus called croup, actually, mostly it can be treated in the outpatient clinic, okay, but sometimes when it gets very serious. It might need、uh, the use of endotracheal intubations. Endotracheal intubations 
we have to put a tube, okay? We have to put a tube uh, to the trachea to help it to uh, the child to breathe. And even when uh, the, uh, the, the trachea and the larynx, the vocal cord is so swelling, there are chances that we might do a tracheostomy to keep the airway open, as we can see. Because the vocal cord is so swelling that we cannot even put an endotracheal intubation. We have to put, we have to cut a hole in the trachea, okay, and put a tube directly into the trachea. This is what we call tracheostomy, and help the baby, the baby breathe through a machine. And the second form of a uh, second type of group is epiglottis. Okay, epiglottis is a much more severe form from viral group. Okay, as we can see in the pictures, this is this is uh, the trachea. We cannot even see the trachea, the hole to the trachea very clearly, right? And the vocal cord is so swelling. You got the trachea got all occluded, all occluded. So the baby, the child might have very severe degree of respiratory distress, uh, distress. And they might experience breathing difficulties, okay? And some child, they can adapt only sitting position and extend their chin forward so they can have their airway opened and uh, through this way, they can breathe very hardly and rapidly, okay? This situation is, might be potential life straightening. It's very, very uh, severe uh, situation for a kid, okay? And when we talk about epiglottis, we have always in, keep in mind, it might be inf, uh, infected by this bacteria called hemophilus influenza. Hemophilus influenza, okay, is a raw like bacteria, and uh, in this type of uh, in bacteria infection it will cause uh, the trachea, uh, the epiglottis swelling very much. Uh, we have keep in mind. So when we saw uh, epiglottis swelling and cannot even see the opening of the, tra of the trachea. We have, we have to always think about the infection of the hemophilus influenza and give a proper treatment uh, for hemophilus influenza, okay? So, okay, as we move on, we can see extra thoracic res respiratory disease, dis disorder there is always a possibility of foreign body aspiration. Does anybody in the class want to take a guess what's happening over here? This is an X-ray taken from a four years old child, okay? However, we found an opaque round object over this area, which is, uh, is uh, through their trachea area, okay, upper trachea way, airway. Does anybody want to take a guess? What is this? Let me ask. Uh, Cindy, Cindy, yeah. Ah, uh, Ken. It's a coin. Yes, very good. So, it's take, right? Yes, very good, Cindy. Yes. And uh very good. I saw it. Yes, it's a coin. It's a quarter, okay? It's a quarter. <laughs> yeah, it's a quarter. It's a US dollar. <laughs> it's a quarter. Yes. It causes a blockage. Not kidding. It causes blockage partially blockage of uh, the upper respiratory tract. It did not abstract completely. When it abstract completely, the baby might have difficulties in, in respiration. 
okay? And uh, through that way, uh, the situation may be life threatening, may be life threatening. And here we saw a very odd condition. Some baby is so ridiculous they can even swallow a brush tooth. Okay? It's ridiculous, right? So, but don't doubt, okay? A baby can swallow anything you can imagine, okay? Even this brush tooth, okay? Uh, this brush, this brush was swallowed by a six-year-old kid. Everybody might think, what's happening with this kid? How can this baby swallow a brush, toothbrush? It's so difficult. Well, when baby play around with a toothbrush, uh, this is what something might happen. Well, it's a rare situation. And in this situation, uh, <laughs> the toothbrush was removed, as we can see, through an endoscope. Okay, through an endoscope. And if the endoscope was failed, cannot remove uh, the toothbrush, the only way to re remove this toothbrush is through operation. Okay, it's through operation. Okay, let's move to the intrathoracic uh, cage of the respiratory tract. Okay, bronchitis. Bronchitis is a very common no. I think uh, through your childhood, uh, you might probably heard many times your parents might tell you that uh, you have bronchitis. Okay, uh, bronchitis can be classified into acute, chronic, or recurrent. What do you mean by acute bronchitis is that mostly it's caused by virus, okay? Uh, especially adenovirus. Uh, it can also cause by bacteria and uh, pertussis or mycoplasma as well, okay? It mostly causes the inflammation of bronchus, okay? Bronchi area, or bronchi area, which is uh, the bronchus. It causes the bron uh, inflammation. And when we say about chronic bronchitis, is when a child it was affected by uh, the pathogens and it had been coughed with sputum, caused by inflammation, and that lasts more than three weeks, is when we give the name of chronic bronchitis. Okay. And there is also a term called recurrent bronchitis. What is a recurrent bronchitis? Is chronic but it's repetitive in nature. When we have repetitive, when we have a repeat or recurrent bronchitis, mostly, mostly, okay, class, keep in mind, there are some non-infectious inflammations, okay? Mostly is causing some, by some predisposing factors, such as underlying the child might have asthma, Sinusitis, or is often uh, exposed to the environment or smoking, especially when the parents are smoking, okay? And the child is allergic to the smoking. Most likely, you will have, he or she will have recurrent bronchitis, okay? So for bronchitis, we need a treatment. is the to remove the sputum, okay? As everybody know, when a child has a bronchitis, uh, the bronchus might produce a lot of sputum. And if the sputum is not removed, it will cause further deterioration of bronchitis and it may even induce pneumonia, okay? So for a child, he, is not, he or she is not like an adult. They can, sp uh, they can spit they're spilling out, okay? So what we need is to need to, uh, uh, to do a chest percussion uh, for the child, especially, especially the anterior mid lung position, okay? Which, this is, most very, this is very important position. We have to place the baby like 10 degree downward, okay? 10 degree downward, okay? So the hip is a little bit high. 
and the head area is a little bit downward, okay? And give a chest percussion. Uh, when we give a chest percussion, we can help the sputum uh, to come out from the bronchus directly to the mouth area of the child. And he might uh, always vomit or spit it out, okay? Spit it out, okay? Okay, and the second common uh, intrathoracic respiratory disease is uh, the bronchiolitis, okay? Bronchiolitis is mainly caused by respiratory syncytial uh, virus, as we can see, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. So the picture in the right, RSV looks like this, okay? It's very much similar to what's going on in the world, coronavirus, right? It's, it's wrong, and it has a lot, a lot of spiking proteins on the sphere of the, of the virus, okay? And secondarily, oh. adenovirus, adenovirus might also cause bronchiolitis, okay? And in addition to COVID, runny nose or rapid breathing might be the symptoms of bronchiolitis, okay? And some might even have wheezing, okay? What we mean by wheezing is when you breathe, you give your sound like, you, 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 okay? And that's a sound from the lower respiratory tract, okay? So you can hear wheezing. You can hear wheezing from the patient who has asthma. And you can hear wheezing from the patient who has bronchiolitis, okay? And for the treatment, is many supportive, okay? Many supportive. We need to give high humidified oxygen, okay? Uh, when you don't have a humidified oxygen device in your home, what can you use? Ah, I think many people uh, have, have, have this device in your home, right? It's the steam, it's the steam device, okay? <laughs> it's a steam device. Oh, you can see in sauna. You can see in sauna, okay? Sauna. Oh, so what you need to do, if you don't have this steam device in your, in your bathroom, what you, need, what you can do is you can produce a lot of steam, okay? In your bathroom, okay? And you can just take the baby into your bathroom with a lot of steam so they can inhale the steam, okay? And the steam can help to soften the sputum. And, uh, and then after uh, the, uh, the uh, steam inhalation, we can take the baby out and give the baby chest percussion, help the baby to spit out the sputum, okay? If there is no complication, antibiotics treatment might not be that necessary, okay? But when the baby is very sick, we always have to consider there might be a possibility of secondary infection or a possibility of bacteria pneumonia, okay? When we talk about pneumonia, we know that the infection had gone to the very lower part of the respiratory tract, the alveoli, okay, the alveoli. This is the alveoli, okay? Alveoli is the area where the gases, O2 and CO2, doing the exchange, okay? This is the final, the terminal part of the respiratory tract. Also. But when, when we have a res, when we have infections, what, what will happen to the alveoli? As we can see the pictures on the right, there are some thickened and accumulation of mucus, okay, accumulated in the alveoli. And uh, this will cause the alveoli collapse and cause the alveoli dysfunction, which it cannot have oxygen doing the exchange properly, okay? And this is what we see in the chest X-ray, okay? As we can, the chest X-ray, a normal chest X-ray is like, you can see the chest X-ray actually is like uh, the black portion, okay? 
uh, the blood portion of the chest X-ray is where the air can go through. All the X-ray can go through your chest cage without any obstruction. But what we see over here, what's happening to the lung? As the class, as everybody can see, the lung has been blocked with a lot of sputants, okay? And, infl and inflammation uh, area. So it become whitish, okay? It become whitish, okay? Or even we can see some pleural effusion, pleural effusion, okay? In this type of situation, this indicates the inflammation and all the infection of alveoli, okay? This is what we call pneumonia, pneumonia, okay? For the new bones, for the new bone, all the immune compromised child, okay, we have to give antibiotics treatments. Or otherwise the condition will go downhill very fast. Okay? So keep in mind, keep in mind. When you see these type of pictures after uh, in your uh, uh, medical career, keep in mind you have to be very careful, okay? And this is a viral pneumonia. Viral pneumonia, as we can see, is caused by what? By virus, okay? It has a similar respiratory symptoms and sign as, uh, as bacterial pneumonia. But what's different is for virus, there is actually no uh, not very effective treatment like what we are facing now in Corona, in COVID-19, okay? So when we, when you are affected by a virus and causing pneumonia, actually, the most, what mostly we can do is to give supportive therapy because our body needs to have antibody against the virus for the patient, for our body to be recovered, okay? So for virus and pneumonia, the many, the treatment is many supportive, okay? Many supportive. Okay, and uh, there are a uh, third type of pneumonia, it's called mycoplasma pneumonia, which means that it's, it, it's caused by mycoplasma. This pathogen is called mycoplasma. It mostly occurs in older kids. What I mean by older kids is the kindergarten age, okay? Kindergarten age. I don't know at what age will the kid goes to kindergarten in Malaysia, okay? But in Taiwan, the kid goes to kindergarten. It's uh, the age of three years old, okay? To six years old, okay? Three to six. They have about three years of uh, three three year uh, three year in kindergarten before they goes to uh, the uh, the first grade okay of elementary. So well, for mycoplasma pneumonia, most occurs three three years of age to six of age okay, and for mycoplasma uh, pneumonia we can use erythromycin as treatment, okay, as treatment. Okay, let's keep on moving to the GI tract, okay? So, is there any questions uh, from the heart or and the respiratory tract? Oh, it seems to me that we have to move fast because, of, because there are a lot more we, we have to go through, okay? Uh, or maybe if we can, uh, we cannot finish on time, we can have uh, the, the second session if it's possible, okay? Uh, for the pediatric gastric tract disease, okay, what's mostly see in a GI problem uh, among the child uh, among the children's uh, abdominal pain. I think everybody in class have experienced abdominal pain during your childhood, right? Okay, but there are many types of abdominal pain. When the pain is in the esophagus. Okay, it will cause the baby to arch his back and cry hard. Okay, and now uh, this is not 
uh, so commonly see in in a uh, in in a uh, in babies. Okay, but uh, however, this happens occasionally when some babies have GE reflux. Okay, GE reflux. What we mean by GE reflux is what the baby drinks mostly milk. Okay, mostly milk. When they drink into their stomach, it reflects to the esophagus area, okay? And this causes the baby uh, irritable sensation, and some even cause it pain, okay? So the baby, after they vomit, they will cry very hard, okay? And the second type of pain is the pain of pancreatitis or peritonitis, okay? This type of pain is so hard that the patient the baby, they don't, they do not dare to move, okay? Because when they're making a sound, when they move their abdomen, well, it will stimulate the pain. So the patient only dare to give a groan, like a grounding sound, like, oh, 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 oh. It sounds like, uh, it's so painful, but uh, he or she doesn't give, uh, doesn't really dare to cry out, okay? Uh, and for the third type of abdominal pain is uh, the pain caused by gastroenteritis, okay? It's like a colic pain. It onset very suddenly, but it often goes away uh, very soon, okay? So this type of pain always accompany sporadic, okay, sporadic, and it's often uh, happens like in diarrhea, okay, in diarrhea when you have gastroenteritis, okay. And now when you have a, a long term abdominal pain, okay, a long term a persistent abdominal pain, or the pain is associated with vomiting or jaundice. We have to, to consider a congenital problem called congenital cholidocal cyst. Cholidocal cyst is an anomaly of the biliary tract, okay? They are type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5, or different types of biliary tract anomaly, okay? This will cause a long-term abdominal pain. So when class, when you have relative or when you have brothers or sisters, they have long-term abdominal pain, we have to be, be careful with it, okay? The best way is to take a thorough examination or even perform an abdominal echo to do out some congenital problem like congenital cholidocal cyst, okay? For abdominal pain, besides the problem with the GI tract, keep in mind, there is always a possibility of pneumonia, okay? Pneumonia or asthma, respiratory disease might cause abdominal pain, okay? Respiratory disease might cause abdominal pain because especially when uh, the pleural effusion accumulated on the diaphragm, okay? It will stimulate the diaphragm and that's why it causes abdominal pain, okay? And the least and the last uh, for the abdominal pain in young child, especially with appendicitis, let me ask the class a question. Does anybody know in adult appendicitis will cause abdominal pain in your right lower quadrant or your left lower quadrant? Which quadrant will cause the uh, the abdominal pain of appendicitis? Does anybody want to take a guess? Is the nice there? Oh, it's right lower up quadrant. I saw it. Very good. Right lower up quadrant. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. For appendicitis, 
in adult, about ninety percent you will present abdominal pain in right lower in right lower quadrant. Yes, very good. Okay, but for appendicitis of children, okay, the abdominal pain is less typical. Okay, it might present maybe periumbilical abdominal pain first, and then the abdominal pain will shift to left side or either right is moving around, okay? So the abdominal pain uh, ca caused by appendicitis in children did not present a very typical pictures of abdominal pain uh, of appendicitis like in adult uh, presentation, okay? Very good, very good class, okay? And uh, another uh, condition if happens it in uh, uh, it occurs in in children is abdominal distension. Okay, in other words, blotting. Okay, blotting. Okay, well, the most common abdominal distension. There are some possibilities of causing abdominal distension. Of course, abdominal tumor we have always to take into consideration, but is not very commonly seen in uh, the stage of child, okay? Ascites, okay? You have information about the GI tract, then you will have ascites. Fraudulence, you will have some gas in your abdomen caused by what you ingest, okay? Like milk, uh, like uh, sweet potato, uh, you will cause fraudulence, okay? All the pacifier is inappropriate. There are a lot of chances when uh, the baby, they want to, uh, uh, the mother give the, the baby a pacifier, okay? But the, ba the baby just suck the pacifier, but at the same time, they, they also swallow a lot of air in. So it will cause their abdominal distension as well. However, the most common situation is the ingestion of lactose contained in milk. Some of the people have lactose intolerance. Okay, it's because they are they do not have enough lactase to digest lactose. So when you take a lot of, too much quality of lactose, you will have abdominal distension. Okay. And the third condition of GI problem in the child is constipation. Okay. Don't laugh. Constipation happens a lot in child. Okay. Is what we mean by constipation is the harden of the texture of stool, okay? However, constipation always can confuse with obstipation, okay? What we mean by obstipation is different, okay, from constipation. As obstipation is the reduce of frequency of stool, okay? So the baby might have stool in three, five, or even one week, okay? But the stool, if the stool is not hard, we can only say the patient, the baby has obstetation, but not constipation, okay? Class, can, uh, can you catch? Okay, so it's different, it's different, okay? Uh, when the stool is first released, okay, the first day, the stool is black, okay? And this is what we call meconium, okay, meconium, okay? However, the stool color gradually fade in two to five days, okay? Into yellow, uh, or, uh, yellowish uh, color. And this is what we call the transitional stool, okay? Uh, and, then, uh, all, and then it will eventually go to green or yellow or golden. Uh, this is what we call uh, the milk stool, okay? Uh, and as for constipation, the treatment, mostly we will try dietary treatment first, okay? This is always given primarily, okay? But if it, and class always remember, okay? When we give dietary treatment, we do not always give fiber only, okay? There are a lot of situations when the patient, when the mother gives only fiber, okay? A lot of cases, like the mother will complain to me in my clinic, they told me that, Dr. Chen, I give 
my baby a lot of apple, okay? A lot of apple. Apple is very rich in fiber, okay? However, how come my baby did not improve his constipation? And indeed, his constipation got worse. What's the problem with only giving apple as treatment? Class, it's because always keep in mind, if you only give sufficient fiber but not water, you will make the situation worse, okay? You will make the situation worse. So when you give sufficient fiber, remember also give sufficient water, okay? Also give sufficient water, okay? And uh, this is what happened for the older child as, as well, okay? Oh, but for older child, we need to take care is that watch, do not give food uh, with high fat in content, okay? Because fat will decrease the, uh, the bowel motility, okay? Will decrease the bowel motility. So when you decrease the bowel motility, the, the food uh, tend to remain in the small bowel a longer time. And the small bowel will pick up the water and it will cause the stool become harder and harder, okay? And when we give dietary treatment, it did not improve. There are some chances that we may shift to stool soft, uh, softener, okay? That we need to give to the child to help relieve uh, constipation, okay? And in opposite to constipation is diarrhea, okay? Oh yeah, by the way, uh, everybody is free to go to the bathroom, okay? Everybody is free to go to the bathroom because we are running out of time. So uh, uh, is, if there is uh, anybody want to go to the bathroom, just go ahead, okay? Oh, <laughs> just go ahead. Uh, but we have to keep on. We have to keep on because we are running out of, of time. Oh, there are, are lots of information that I would like to pass it to you guys. I'm very happy to have this international class. So, but uh, okay, don't hold your pee. <laughs> don't hold your pee, okay? Uh, all right, so let's keep on going. Let's for diarrhea. Diarrhea. How, what do we mean by diarrhea, okay? They have to fulfill two categories, okay? First, is the increase in frequency of defecation, okay? Increased frequency of defecation, okay? For example, the texture of the stool become mushy or watery, okay? Mushy or watery, okay? This is the first uh, category. And the second, co the second category is the increase of stool volume, okay? Increase of stool volume, okay? Take an, uh, for, uh, for example, for a child less than or equal to three years old, if the amount of defecation is greater than 50 gram per kg per day, we can say it's a diarrhea, okay? So, uh, there are causes, a lot of causes, many causes of diarrhea in children, okay? Acute diarrhea is following me by diarrhea for less than two weeks, okay? Most likely, uh, the need for acute diarrhea is caused by some infectious uh, pathogens such as rotavirus or salmonella, okay, or salmonella, okay. And when you have diarrhea more than two weeks, well, it's mostly caused by chronic situation in the GI tract, okay. So for, for, a, treatment, for a treatment of uh, diarrhea, very importantly, we need to give the parent uh, health education, some educational instruction, okay? What we mean, education, health education instruction is mostly diarrhea can uh, spontaneously recover, most like, uh, mostly, okay? But there are always some phenomenon there are always some situation that we need needs to be watch out, like if the child develop dehydration, okay, dehydration. 
Okay, the child might have dehydration if they have a decreased anterior, depressed anterior fontanel. Okay, everybody know that a child they have a, a anterior fontanel kept wide open uh, before one year or one year and a half uh, year of age. Okay, and if the fontanel is depressed. You have to keep in mind there might be a possibility of dehydration, okay? And secondarily, there might be a sunken eyes, okay? The eyes sunk, okay? The eyes sunk, okay? Dry skin, okay? Dry skin, okay? The child, uh, the, the skin is dry and yellowish, okay? And poor skin turgor, okay? What we mean by poor skin turgor is when you pinch the skin, okay, when you pinch your skin, hold the skin together and release it, you can see the skin recover very, restore to its original place very slowly, okay, very slowly. Normally, you can take a pinch on your skin now and see how your skin recover almost when you let go the pinch, almost your skin will restored to its original place, right? So when a child has a poor skin turgor, we have to watch out. Maybe there is a dehydration condition happening to this child, okay? And uh, for this type of situation, what can we do, okay? We can give uh, electrolyte water for a child with dehydration, okay? Electrolyte water, okay? What we mean by electrolyte water? This is some especially made, okay? Drinks for the child, okay? But always remember, do not use diluted sport drinks, okay? Do not use diluted small drinks, okay? Because when you use diluted small drinks, it's not, a, it's not the same as electrolyte waters, okay? Keep in mind, okay? Keep in mind. And always keep in mind too, the diet needs to be light, okay? Light, okay? Don't give a very oily diet, okay? Or rich diet. Okay, let's move to the pediatric infectious disease. For infectious disease, some most commonly see infectious disease in childhood is the Rosella infantum, okay? Rosella infantum, it most likely it occurs from six months, six months to three years of age, okay? Especially around one year of old, okay? Uh, it will mostly present with fever, okay? Fever, okay? And it's costly, many by human herpes virus type 6, herpes type 6, okay? The symptoms, mostly the child, about 90% will present with high fever, okay? High fever, and uh, that's a fever above 90 degrees uh, Celsius, okay? And uh, anorexia, which gives uh, poor appetite, irritability, the child, because uh, he feels very uncomfortable, so it's very irritable, okay? However, these symptoms might subside within 72 hours, okay? Oh, and uh, after the, the fever subsides, the rush will appear, or the rush will appear, okay? So most likely, when you see a fever for about three days, 72 hours, and then when the fever gradually improve, but there comes the skin rush. Most likely it's caused by is is the roseola infantum, okay? Is the roseola infantum. Huh. And uh, for the roseola infantum, uh, the rush it caused it mostly lasts one to two days. Oh, mostly 
uh, last one to two days. And it has a complication. The complication most like most common is seizure, okay? Seizure, seizure like uh, due to high fever, okay? Due to high fever. So for Rosella in fountain, keep in mind, do not let the child have fever to above 90 degrees Celsius, okay? Control the fever with medication. You can prevent, you, know, you can reduce, you reduce the chances of seizure, okay? Okay, uh, for infectious disease, another important thing is chickenpox, okay? Which is caused by, uh, is also called varice varicella, or varicella. Chickenpox is a very contagious virus infection. It's caused by the air infection, okay, air infection, similar to COVID-19, okay, the droplet will flow in the air for a certain period of time. So chicken pulse has a very high, very high infectious rate, okay, very high infectious rate. During uh, my childhood, almost if there is a person that has chicken pox in your class, most likely the whole class will have chicken pox, okay? The whole class will have chicken pox. Uh, so it's very highly, very highly contagious. It's not only air infection, okay? It's not only caused by the droplet infection, it's also caused by direct contact infection, okay? So when you contact, when you touch the skin of a, a person with chicken pox, <coughs> You will be infected. You will be infected. Okay, and the infection period is one to two days before rush. So it's very difficult to prevent because not even the rush is appear. You don't know the pe the, the person having chicken pox. So class, as you can see, is one to two days before the rush appear. Okay one to two days before the rush, and after the rush appear. So it's very difficult to prevent, okay? Very difficult to prevent, okay? And the rush develop in the order of erysema, which is flat, papule, which is a little bit elevated, blister is a, is a vesicle with some fluid inside, and pustule is a physical with a purulent discharge inside. Okay? You can see all stage of uh, skin rashes in uh, the children with chicken pox. You can see all stages. Erysema, papule, blister, or pustule. Okay? All together. Uh, when you see some skin rash with all these types of skin uh, eruptions, you have to think about if the children has a chicken pox infection or not, okay? Keep in mind. Well, for the chicken pox in, uh, infection, what we need to keep in mind is also complication. Secondarily, mostly is secondary bacteria infection of the skin, okay? In this picture, you can see the skin is too itchy, okay? It's very itchy, so the child will scratch the skin. So as everybody can see, look, the skin got infected, got infected, okay? So bacterial infection of the skin is the most commonly seen complication of varicella. And the second commonly seen is pneumonia. It's virus pneumonia caused by the varicella virus, okay? So like what we see in respiratory infections, the, the, the lung has been white out, right? The, the lung has been white out, okay? So it's very important, okay? And even more severe, uh, there are a possibility of encephalitis, okay? That's a very severe complication. What we mean by encephalitis is the inflammation of your brain, of your brain. Uh, mostly occurred three to eight days after the onset of the disease. Okay, three or eight days after the onset of the disease. 
And the fourth, rice disease, rice syndrome. Rice syndrome is caused when you are affected by the virus and you took some inappropriate antipyretic medication such as aspirin, okay? Such as aspirin. The medication got interact with the virus and cause the liver, okay? The liver dysfunction, dysfunction, okay? It's very rare, it's very rare, but it happens. So always keep, keep in mind, class, when you face a patient has varicella, or when you're a relative, or your neighborhood, or your brother's sister's child has varicella, do not give aspirin as antipyretic medication, okay? Because there might give, uh, there might be possibility uh, that induce uh, the liver dysfunction and causes Ray syndrome, okay? And uh, for uh, chicken pox, for the treatment, well, it's mainly supportive, okay? Many supportive. But when the skin is too itchy, okay, we can give this medication called calamine. Calamine lotion, okay, calamine lotion. Uh, it tend to uh, reduce the itchy sensation, the uh, itchy sensation, okay? And uh, if there is combined with some bacterial infection, always keep in mind when there is bacterial infection, we have to give antibiotics to control the bacterial infection. Okay, next, let's move to mumps, okay? Mumps is also a commonly see uh, virus uh, infection, but uh, it's become uh, even rarer and rarer because uh, I don't know what, uh, in, in Malaysia, but uh, now at the present days, we always give uh, MMR vaccination, right? As for MMR. M, the first M stands for measles, the second M stands for mumps, uh, and the, the R stands for rubella. So we have MMR vaccination. I believe there is MMR vaccination in Malaysia as well. So because uh, we give routine vaccination to prevent mumps, uh, the incidence of uh, happening mumps, of uh, have mumps is now very, very low. But there are there is still chances that uh, mumps will occur. Okay, mumps will occur. But for mumps, what we need to know is some uh, possible complications. Okay, some possible complications. What are the possible complications? The uh, the most important one is testicular inflammation, okay? Testicular inflammation or ovary inflammation, okay? So what it happens is when the person with mumps, oh, mumps, we can see the swelling, the swelling of parotid gland, okay? Parotid gland. How do we differ, differentiate uh, mumps swelling, parotid gland swelling, and lymph node swelling? Okay, class, it's very easy. What you need to do is to draw a line on the uh, ear, uh, ear end to the chin, okay? To the chin area, draw a line, okay? And if the swelling is on the line, there's many parotid gland swelling, okay? And if the swelling is either in front or uh, on Behind the line is mainly caused by the lymph node swelling, okay? So for mumps, we can see the swelling is on the line, is on the line, okay? So class, remember, if you see a child with mumps, okay? And he complains, for a girl, he complains abdominal pain. We have to watch out. Watch out for the possibility of ovary inflammation, ovary inflammation, okay? 
And for a male, if he has mumps and he complains testicular pain, we have to keep in mind there might be a possibility of testicular inflammation. Okay? And more importantly, if the patient has mumps and he complains headache, remember, remember the possibility of meningitis. Okay? Of meningitis. Okay? This is very important. Okay? Okay, next we move on to enterovirus. Enterovirus is a very famous virus. I believe everybody knows enterovirus. And uh, this virus is infected through fecal and oral cavities and uh, re respiratory tract infection, okay? It's more likely to occur in childhood, okay? However, let me ask class, do you think enterovirus will infect adult? Anybody think if an enterovirus will affect adult or it affects only in child? Uh, is uh, Bariana? Bariana, what do you think? Can enterovirus affect adult or does enterovirus only affect child? Bariana, what do you think? Oh, uh, Aslin? Mohami? Both. Bariana, yes. Yes, both. Very good. Enterovirus not only infect young child, okay? It can only affect adult as well, okay? Especially when the adult uh, is, not, is, is not in a very good uh, health condition, okay? But what enterovirus uh, will cause this severe disease most likely is in child. Oh, for the severe, severe disease that causes enterovirus is in child, okay? It's in child, okay? There are types of enterovirus. Uh, the most commonly seen enterovirus is Kosaki A virus, okay? It causes herpangina. Herpangina, as we can see in this picture, this is the throat of a, of a, of a kid, okay? We can see the throat that there are whitish Posture on the throat, okay, on the po posterior pharyngeal wall, okay. This is what we call herpangina, okay. But uh, and also there are, are rashes on hand, foot, and mouth, okay. It's called hand for mouth disease or lymphonodular pharyngitis. There is a pharyng there is a pharyngitis, inflammation of the pharynx, and also lymph node swelling, and it's most caused by Kosaki A virus, okay. And the second type is Kosaki B virus, okay? For Kosaki B virus, this type of virus causes some even more severe disease, okay? It causes myocarditis in, chi in young children, okay? It also causes endocarditis in, in young children as well, okay? So this is what happens during the pandemic of enterovirus. A lot of people, not a lot of people, there are chances when we see uh, some children that look very toxic, that look very ill, and was taken uh, to the ER, the emergency room, uh, by their parents. We have always need to check the heart enzyme because myocarditis needs to be ruled out, okay? Myocarditis needs to be ruled out. What we mean by myocarditis is that inflammation of the heart muscles, okay? Inflammation of heart muscles. And this is caused by the virus. And, of course, if the heart muscles was, has inflammation, it might cause the heart muscles pumping dysfunction, okay? Pump, pumping dysfunction, okay? And in a worse situation, the heart well, will just not pump, okay? The heart will just not pump, okay? So it's very, very severe. It's very severe, okay? And uh, both Kosaki, Kosaki A uh, and Kosaki B virus can both cause 
uh, symptoms and signs of uh, upper respiratory tract infection, pneumonia, uh, non specific fever, or a septic meningitis as well. Okay, always keep this in, in mind. Okay. Okay, let's move to the bacterial infection. For the bacterial infection in the childhood disease, during the uh, during the childhood, is caused uh, the the number one uh, bacteria is Streptococcus. Streptococcus. Okay. What we mean by Streptococcus? Excuse me. Let me take a sip of water. Sorry. Okay, for a uh, for a streptococcal infection, okay, the first to, to keep in mind is the scarlet fever. Okay, the scarlet fever is a disease that caused by streptococcal infection. Okay, and initially it present as uh, tonsillitis or dermatitis. Okay, and after twenty four to forty eight hours, the red spot will appear. Okay, and uh. The skin tend to be, oops. The skin tend to be uh, like sunburn, sunburn like uh, uh, redness. Okay, sunburn like redness. Okay, and after it become red, the skin rash will increase after hours. And what the most important, uh. Uh, skin symptoms is when you touch the skin, you will feel like the skin is not smooth. Okay, it's not smooth. The skin become rough, and some will appear like the skin of a dark skin. Okay, or goose skin. Okay, or goose skin. I don't know if any one of you have the chances or have the experience of touching a goose neck or a dark skin. Okay. It's like a pumping. It's very rough. Okay, it's not like a, the skin of your girlfriend or your boyfriend. It's very smooth. Okay, it's it's rough. Okay, and this is what we call goose goose neck skin. Okay, this is a very important sign of scarlet fever. Okay, and uh, in this in scarlet fever, besides uh, the skin rash, there are a possibility the child. May present with abdominal pain, will also present with abdominal pain. Okay, and the area among around the mouth will be pale, will be pale. Okay, will be pale, and some even have strawberry tongue. Okay, what we mean by strawberry tongue? Everybody knows strawberry, right? It has a reddish spot. So we can see a reddish spot on the whitish. A tongue, okay, on a pale tongue, a reddish spot on a pale tongue, okay. So this is what I call a strawberry tongue, okay. Uh, this is some very typical pictures of streptococcal infection, okay, scarlet fever. And second disease that caused by the streptococcal is the is what we call erysipela, okay, erysipela. Erysipela, as we can see from the pictures, is that it's the infection of the skin, okay? And the infected, the affected area is red, swollen, and it's painful, okay? And it's very clearly, the border is very clearly cut, and it's so slightly elevated compared to the surrounding, okay? This is erysipela, okay? So for erysipela, we need. We also have to notice it is caused by the Streptococcus bacteria. Okay, and the third disease uh, is impetigo. Okay, impetigo. It can be caused both by the Streptococcus and another bacteria called Staphylococcus. Okay, it causes small blisters. These blisters around and. Uh, Ambu like ambu color, amber, amber color, purulent crust around perioral area. Okay, so when you see a child, okay, they have this presentation. 
they have when they have this presentation, always keep in mind there might be a possibility of streptococcus or staphylococcus infection. Okay, and this also too. Okay, blisters or oh, blisters around perioral area. Keep in mind streptococcus or staphylococcus infection. Okay, and there are all. Uh, always a possibility of uh, streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. What does it mean? Uh, it means uh, by a toxic shock syndrome. It's similar to uh, staphylococcus, okay? It will accompany, the infection will accompany with fever, <coughs> erythema, <coughs> and low blood pressure, okay? It's almost have shock condition, no blood pressure, okay? So, streptococcus, when it present with a low blood pressure, or oh, you have, we have to watch out, it might, and that, it might then progress to a toxic shock syndrome, okay? And so for streptococcus, we need to, there is no other treatment. The only treatment is antibiotics, okay? Antibiotics, okay? And for staphylococcus, staphylococcus infection, okay, the most commonly seen is the infection of the skin, okay, infection of the skin. And most commonly seen are three categories, three types of staphylococcus of the skin, the folliculitis, the, foron the foroncos, and the carbuncles, okay. Uh, for the folliculitis, is the lesion is confined only to the hair follicles, like this one, okay. The lesion is uh, confined only to these hair follicles, okay? Uh, and it might have a deep folliculitis. The inflammation is get involved even deeper, a uh, deeper area, okay? And for a furunco, is the adjacent sebaceous gland was invaded, as we can see. Not only the follicles, are affected the adjacent the adjacent sebaceous gland are also infected okay so this is what we call furunco okay furunco okay and if the infection become more and more severe okay this the adjacent hair follicle and sebaceous gland are affected it's called kabanko, okay? It's called kabanko. So does anybody uh, know uh, the difference between folliculitis, furunco, and kabanko now? Okay? Oh, for folliculitis, furunco, kabanko, okay? Oh, kabanko. And this is all caused by staphylococcus infection. And staphylococcus infection, you will cause also food poisoning, oh, food poisoning. And uh, for different type of food poisoning, uh, actually, from the type of po uh, food poisoning, it will have different type of presentations, okay? For example, if the food poisoning is caused by staphylococcus, the diarrhea, the, the symptoms and signs, like vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, mostly will occur one to six hours after eating. Okay, after eating, one to six hour right after eating. Okay. So when you have an abdominal pain, when you have a diarrhea or vomiting, not long after you finish your lunch, you might be have <laughs> a food poisoning caused by the enterotoxin secreted by staphylococcus, okay? Secreted by, a toxic, uh, by a, a staphylococcus. And this is very important. If the abnormal pain does not improve and you feel more and more disease, and you are having a, a low blood pressure, you might have a toxic shock syndrome, like what's happening in, streptor, uh, in streptococcus, okay? And uh, there are chances 
when the chef, okay, why cause this food poisoning? Most likely, most likely, it's cause when the chef, okay, when the chef, when you go to a restaurant, but the chef, he has a, a cut in his finger, okay, and he did not take a proper management of this cut. And uh, there are some bacteria like Staphylococcus grows on the cut, okay? And when he is managing your food, the meat got mixed with his cut, and so it got mixed with the Staphylococcus, it will, the bacteria will then get into your meat, get into your meal, okay? And when you eat that, well, too bad, you will get infected. Okay, let's move to the pediatric neurological disease. Okay, is there any problem with the infectious disease? Hello, class. All right. If there's no problem, let's keep on moving, okay? Neurological disease. The most commonly seen neurological disease in childhood is epilepsy, okay? Epilepsy. What epilepsy will present with seizure, okay? Seizure, okay? And there are three different types of seizure, okay? The first type is about 20% of seizure type is non-epileptic seizure class. When we talk about seizure, okay, not only will you present it with seizure-like movement, okay? Some seizure is like you are out. You are uh, you are out of your mind. Like you are you are uh, you are thinking of something. You are like you are <laughs> you. You know what I mean? You know what Doctor Chen means? You do not have seizure-like activities, but you you just out of your mind. Okay, like blink, like a blank in your brain. Okay, but you do not have any seizure activity. And this might be a non-epileptic seizure presentation, okay? And there are 30% of people that might have generalized seizure. What we mean by generalized seizure means that your body, your hand, your trunk, your extremity are having seizure activities, okay? General, the whole body is having uh, is having uh, seizure activities, okay? And there are 60% of seizure type that present with focal seizure, focal seizure. What we mean by focal seizure is like only localized to your extremities, like your left upper arms, your left lower arms, uh, left lower extremities, or your right upper arms, or your right lower extremities, okay? Focalized to a certain area, okay? So keep in mind, there are three types of seizure type, okay? And the incidence is about 30 per 1,000, okay? 30 per 1,000, okay? It's mainly caused by uh, the excessive discharge of brain cell, okay? Of brain cell. It's either caused by congenital or acquired brain diseases, okay? But uh, uh, even more commonly seen is uh, verbal conversion, okay? What we mean by a verbal conversion is obvious, we, as we can see, uh, the name verbal, okay? This happens when the people, uh, when the child is experience seizure, and they also have conversion, seizure attack, okay, seizure attack. But most likely, uh, the EEG will appear normal within a week, okay, will appear normal within a week, okay. But if the EEG is abnormal, okay, more than 10 days, then we have to keep a detailed survey because 
the epilepsy, the the chances of becoming of having an epilepsy is much greater in the future. So what we mean by a verbal convulsion? What we mean by verbal convulsion is this situation only occur when the child has fever, okay? And it finish when the fever goes away. And most likely, this verbal convulsion has a family tendency, okay? Has a family tendency, which means when your father or your mother has a verbal convulsion history in his or her childhood, well, the chances of your child having a verbal convulsion in your uh, in their childhood is higher, okay? And the prognosis of verbal convulsion is general is generally very good, okay? But however, always keep in mind, verbal convulsion there is a possibility of causing mortality as well, okay? And this is situation is when uh, the verbal convulsion progress to a status epidepticus condition. What we mean by a status epidepticus condition is when the seizure keep on going and it lasts more than 30 minutes, okay? The seizure lasts more than 30 minutes. And this is a situation that a child is very difficult to bear this condition, okay? When a person experience seizure-like condition, more than 30 minutes is very difficult to tolerate, okay? And uh, so there are uh, chances of 0 0.5 to 11% of mortality rate, or uh, mortality rate. Okay, and the third condition that we encounter in a uh, neurological disease in childhood is hydrocephalus, okay? Hydrocephalus, as we can see in these pictures, in this picture, is the brain is filled. As we can see, right? The baby is having a big head, okay? And what it causes is the brain, the cerebral fluid accumulated in the brain, okay? The cerebral fluid accumulated in the brain. And the cause of hydrocephalus can be either a stenosis of the cerebral aqueduct or intracranial hemorrhage, okay, caused by the blood vessel destruction, okay? And the first type, when it caused by the stenosis of the cerebral aqueduct, is called an obstruction type, okay? And the second type is called communication type because the intracranial hemorrhage caused the brain cell cannot absorb, cannot absorb the cerebral fluid that it produces that appropriately, okay? So even though there is no stenosis or obstruction in the cerebral aqueduct, but due to the malfunction of the brain cell, because it, it cannot absorb the cerebral fluid, the cerebral fluid tend to accumulate in the brain. And this is what we call uh, the communication type of uh, hydrocephalus, okay? And for the children with hydrocephalus, their head circumference will increase dramatically, okay? The suture, the head suture will widen it. Okay, and more importantly, we can see from their appearance is that they have a sunset eye, sunset eye. This is sunset eye is because the brain, the hydrocephalus, causing intracranial, the brain uh, pressure increase too much and it tend to push downward the eyeball, okay? So the eyes tend to have a sunset, the eye, you cannot uh, look upward, okay? And for the treatment of hydrocephalus, all we do is to place a VP shunt, okay? A VP shunt. A VP shunt is 
to put a tube underneath your skin from the brain, the aqueduct, into the intraperitoneal cavity. Okay, so the brain, the excessive uh, cerebral fluid will flow through the VP shunt into the uh, abdominal cavity. This is the only way to solve hydrocephalus. The only way to solve hydrocephalus. Okay? But, of course, uh, there is always a possibility that uh, the VP shunt, uh, the site in the intra-abdominal region will get infected will get infected and the infected pathogen will go through the VB shunt and run up to the brain and cause the brain infection. Okay? Some even have brain abscess formation. Some even have brain abscess formation. Oh. So hydrocephalus is, is a poor condition, uh, a neurological condition uh, in the childhood. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to the pediatric hematology, okay? Uh, the most common is in pediatric hematological disease is anemia, okay? Anemia, anemia. And the most commonly seen pediatric anemia is iron deficiency anemia, okay? Iron deficiency anemia. This is caused by, of course, it's caused, sorry, it's caused by the deficiency of iron, okay? Insufficiency of iron supply. Or the baby has an increased need of iron, okay? Like uh, the pre in premature baby, a low birth weight baby, or during the, pu the uh, pu puberty, uh, like in, uh, uh, in young uh, female teenagers, or cyanotic heart diseases, uh, some even can be caused by chronic blood loss, like hookworm infection or chronic uh, GI tract bleeding, and so on. And here is an example of hookworm infection. During uh, earlier days, when Taiwan is still in uh, agriculture, uh, industrial period of times, the farmers tend to go to the uh, the rice field with their bare foot, okay? With their bare foot. So the many situations is the hookworm will go through, will go through uh, their bare foot and get infected, okay? The farmers will be infected and the, uh, the hookworm will go with the, will enter the bloodstream of the farmer and go to a uh, uh, re resident in the uh, lung area, okay? And in the lung area, the it will produce eggs, okay? The eggs will be coughing out like sputum, and some of the sputum will be swallowed into the GI tract, and uh, the egg, the what we call the egg is uh, ova, okay? The egg will be incubated in the GI tract and then become lava. Lava is the, the baby of, of hookworm, okay? And the baby of hookworm, it will uh, just live in the GI tract of the farmer and then suck the blood from the GI tract. And it will cause the farmer chronic blood loss, chronic blood loss, and uh, it caused anemia, okay? That's in the agricultural industrial period of time, okay? But uh, because now uh, it's very rare, this thing, because uh, everybody has a much better health uh, concept. So even the farmer, okay, well, now we are using uh, machineries to uh, plant uh, the rice. Uh, so the hookworm infection is very much decreased, okay? And for uh, chronic anemia, the patient might have 
long term paleness, okay? And you and the, uh, the child might have a, a rapid heartbeat, a systolic heart murmur, and a tongue atrophy, and most like most importantly, you can see from uh, his nail. The nail is different from yours and our minds. Look, the nail is what? Is sunken into a teaspoon shape. Can class see this nail is sunken? Right? It's sunken. Uh, it's very different from what we have uh, uh, in yours or ours, okay? And the treatment is very important, okay? Treatment, of course, if you have a is treat underlying disease, okay? When you have blood loss, of course, you need to cure the blood loss first. If you have a hookworm infection, you need, you need to kill the, frog, the, the hookworm first, okay? And uh, besides that, you also need to give uh, some ferrous sulfate for, uh, oral for oral supplement, okay? Generally, when you give like five to six milligrams per kg, okay, per day. For four weeks, you will correct, you will correct anemia, okay? But that's not enough, okay? That is not enough, okay? You need to continuously to the oral treatment for three to four months, okay? So you can restore the iron uh, insufficiency in your bone marrow, okay? In your bone marrow. Oh. Okay, and uh, secondary, besides iron anemia, iron deficiency anemia, the second commonly see anemia is what we call hemolytic anemia, okay? As we all know, the lifespan of a red blood cell is how long? It's 120 days, okay? It's like three months, uh, three to four months, okay? Three to four months, okay? If the red blood cell is shortened, the lifespan of the, life, uh, of the red blood cell is shortened, we will call hemolytic anemia. Due to internal or external factor, it's called hemolytic anemia, okay? And uh, most conditions that cause hemolytic anemia is the first condition is due to red blood cell membrane defect, okay? Red blood cell membrane defect. As we all know that our red blood cell has a shape of a what? Does anybody can tell me? Is there anybody can tell me? Our red blood cell has a shape of what? nice can you please tell dr chen our red blood cell has a uh, has a shape of what a round disc or like a sphere or like a plate very good this by uh bacon cave very good by concave disc very good. This is uh, T. Yeah, uh, t teach, teach. Very good, very good. Yes, by concave disc, okay? It's like a plate, okay? So when the red blood cell, the cell membrane has some hereditary defect, it has a sphere, a sphere, uh, a, a spherocytosis. Or it has an ecliptic form, sphere form or epileptic form, the red blood cell tend to be destruct very easily by the spleen. Okay? So this will cause hemolytic uh, anemia as well. Okay? And uh, most likely, if uh, the, the kids have this congenital uh, cell, red blood cell membrane disease, most likely, the children, uh, the children will receive blood transfusion regularly and eventually needs to uh, receive splenectomy by the age of six to eight years of age, okay? And uh, 
Reverse cell metabolism defect. Okay, this is very uh, well not not very common, but it's is considered common in Taiwan. I don't know what about in Malaysia because uh, this has some uh, races uh, difference. Okay, in Taiwan, the Hakka the the Hakka uh, races has the highest G6PD deficiency rate in male, okay? And about, it's like 5.5% in, in male and 23 in female. And what we mean by G6PD deficiency is that we know that uh, in uh, the red blood cell, cell membrane, we use glucose 6-phosphate to uh, 6 Six phosphor uh, gluconate, gluconate, okay, and through the process is by an enzyme called glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase, okay. It will help GCSG to produce glucose uh, C, glucose ion, okay, and this is a very good antioxidant, okay. This is a very good antioxidant. It can help uh, the red blood cell from oxidation stress, okay? So if the person, if the children has G6PD deficiency, the antioxidant activity will be decreased. So it will, when uh, the child encounter, encounter some situation like uh, exposed to a highly oxidative stress uh, condition, like take some uh, valve bead, okay? It will, it will, it produce uh, the cell, the red blood cell uh, uh, broke down. Uh, well, it seems like, uh, is it? We have only three minutes left. Wow, time goes so fast. I would like to take uh, the three minutes, see if I can finish. Uh, the hematological disease, because we still have some endocrine and uh, immunological disease that I would like to share, maybe some other time, okay? But let's see if we can finish hematological disease, okay? Uh, next, when we talk about hematological disease, we cannot only think about red blood cell, right? There are also a possibility of white blood cell uh, uh, problem, okay? So when we talk about the white blood cell problem, the neutropenia. In neutropenia, we know that the, the neutral field, okay, the neutral field, as we can see, there might be a cyclic neutropenia, okay, cyclic neutropenia condition. This condition is a hereditary, hereditary condition that the child will experience a cyclic decrease in neutral field, okay? Decrease in neutral field, okay? And it will depend, uh, it will go from mild to severe left threatening condition and then recover to mild, okay? So as we can see, it will, it's grading from zero to five. When it is less than 0 0.5 times uh, 10 to the ninth power, uh, is considered a uh, very severe, very severe uh, new, uh, cyclic neutropenia. And this will cause uh, the patient be infected very easily, be infected very easily, okay? Uh, and uh, about the uh, hematological disease, there is another thing we need to talk about is the bleeding tendency, which is the platelet ab abnormality, okay? The platelet ab abnormality that we can see there is a thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia, it means that uh, the, uh, the, the platelet is decreased. It's decreased. Uh, and this mostly happened, mostly happened at the age from two years old to five years old, okay? And most likely it was induced by a virus infection, okay? It was induced by a virus infection. And after a viral infection, our body triggers an immune response. And this immune response 
it will our body will produce an antibody to destruct the platelet of ourselves and it causes the platelet to decrease. And this is what we call the thrombocytopenia, okay? And most require do not require special treatment. Mostly do not require special treatment. Okay? But however, keep in mind, okay, if the platelet is less than twenty thousand per millimeter cube, there is an increase of risk of intracranial hemorrhage, okay? We don't want to see that, okay? So if uh, the platelet count is less than 20,000, remember, maybe uh, we should go to hospital, okay? We need a strictly bed rest, okay? And steroid or immunoglobulin might require to give to the, pa uh, the, the patient, okay? And remember, do not transfuse platelet, okay? Do not think uh, the platelet is decreased. So let's just give, give the kids platelet. No, our body will, will react to the platelet and even produce more platelet antibody and cause the condition even worse, okay? The condition even worse, okay? So platelet transfusion was saved only to the very last moment. Like say, the platelet is less than not only 20,000, but less than 2,000, okay? Okay, so another condition on um, bleeding, uh, bleeding tendency is due to platelet dysfunction, okay? Platelet dys dysfunction, we know that there might be some co coagulation factors that help the platelet to coagulate, like protein, T, protein C, protein S, and antithrombin 3, okay? So, if the patient, if the patient, uh, he is lacking protein C, protein S, and anti or anti thrombin sign uh, three. This patient might have a, a coagulation tend tendency, okay? Coagulation tendency, okay? And cause vascular embolism, okay? And cause vascular, vascular embolism. And this is the coagulation abnormality, okay? And another, everybody is more familiar, is hemophilia, okay? The hemophilia mostly due to coagulation factor deficiency in factor A, factor 9, or factor uh, 11, okay? And all this uh, coagulation uh, hemophilia deficiency, it will cause condition like internal bleeding, infection, because it will have uh, in bleeding in the angle area, like bleeding in the, uh, in, in the joint area. In the joint area or in a brain area, it will cause that area to be infected, okay? To be infected. So hemophilia, in the hemophilia person, what we concerned is not only uh, uh, coagulation problem, but also infection problems or anemia problems, okay? Okay. Well, too bad. Time runs really fast. So I hope uh, maybe in the near future, we still have some time I can share with you guys uh, some pediatric endocrine disorder as well as the immunological disorder, okay? But I really appreciate uh, this class and uh, especially uh, a lot of uh, very good uh, class uh, give me some feedback. I, I'm uh, really grateful and uh, really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed this class. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to answer uh, any question, if there is any. Thank you. So is there any question for the, for the uh, uh, previous topic that uh, Dr. Chen uh, mentioned? Okay, uh, if, if there is uh, no question, I think uh, I will just end the class now, and I hope I can see you guys in the near future soon.
Bye bye. Take care. Thank you, doctor. Bye.